Hello everyone, this is a video which I'm making today on completion of uh, our uh, CF final financial reporting full English batch. We started this batch uh, around three months ago and uh, today was the 70th lecture of this particular batch. In fact, 71st and we completed the whole syllabus of CA final financial reporting in somewhere around 200 to 210 hours. Three hours lecture, 70 lectures, 71 lectures, covering uh, each and every particular chapter, whether it is theory, practical, every particular chapter of this particular syllabus or your subject. Particularly, how did the batch go? I mean, I was very, very pleased with the batch. And uh, though I've been taking the CA final financial reporting uh, subject since 2017, and I've taken almost like uh, 13 odd regular batches, this, in fact, regular plus fast track or exam oriented and all. This was the first full English batch which we had taken. And uh, how could we complete this batch in a span of 200 210 hours where our regular batches uh, which is of mixed language remember this is also a regular batch but we are not calling it as regular or exam oriented this is the one and the only batch because uh, we've covered everything just like the regular batch and the timing and the duration is uh, so efficiently managed in this batch that uh, there is no further scope for speeding it up or pacing it up and reducing the hours further without missing on the coverage. So uh, what we actually did and how did we save time on this is number one, usually when I speak only in English, I am a little more efficient compared to when I speak in dual language because in the mixed language batch, there are a lot of things which because we have to write in the exams in English, I actually kind of narrate and I kind of explain once in English and then I translate it into Hindi and then I kind of further explain it. So we save time in general in English language discussion. This is also more little more efficient because in Hindi sometimes we do a little more of dialogue and uh, not exactly time pass we hardly do at any time in our batch but yes in the live batches there are these dialogues which do happen which uh, were lesser in that particular sense. So I'll not say that the batch was less interactive, uh, but yes, uh, this would be lesser in a pure English batch. It is a live batch, 100% with no blending, not even a single lecture, because I told you this is the first time we're recording in full English. So all the lectures were taken live and they are all fresh lectures. And in terms of questions coverage, it is beyond anything because we've covered even May 24 exam questions in the class itself. So the book which we use, the striker book has 1700 odd questions in which we would have easily solved 1000 plus questions. In fact, around 1300 questions in the class, the 300, 400 questions, which you would not have taken would be mostly either the same repetitive questions, which are put in a self practice because the numbers and the figures are just slightly different. Otherwise the question is repeat or pure theory questions like based on definition of control and others. So despite that, we were able to cover it one because of the language efficiency and second, what we did is usually in our regular batches, what we take or the mixed language or even fast track, we do a lot of polling in the class. This time what we did is all those poll questions we had incorporated and we kind of just discussed it as in I threw the questions, students gave the answer in the chat and then we started discussing it. So there was that waiting time, which we usually have in polls was not there. It's not that we've not taken polls. I mean, we've not taken those questions in the class. The pattern of the study is absolutely the same, but we've saved a lot of time in practicing polls in the class. So without missing on that uh, knowledge, we have saved a little bit on the time. But I think in terms of coverage, it is absolutely just similar to the regular batch which we have. So do you recommend this uh, to students only of the southern part of India? I think anybody who is comfortable understanding what I'm saying right now could kind of refer this particular batch. This batch comes with two books, which is Brahmastra volume one and two. And uh, this is uh, once again, your concept book, which is like notebook style, which has all your content like this explained with some examples in between and all that stuff. So it is pretty comprehensive. You don't have to really use too much of board notes, except for question answer solving, which you've done. Everything else was there here. 
we've also improvised on the book uh, substantially because of that the writing part in the class has substantially reduced and it is mostly concept uh, absorption and then we definitely go through the particular text of the material and mark and do annotations here question bank again you get striker and you get video pods for each and every question of the striker question bank is it so yes and is these are these in uh, pure english yes so what we have done is we have clipped uh, basically um, other class videos and in case uh, all these questions and we have added them into the qr codes here what we have done is we've also updated our application so now if you kind of have this striker question bank and you access this qr code you will find two video options one in full english and one in mixed language so uh, the same question bank is used by students of uh, the mixed language regular batch the exam oriented mixed language fast track batch and now in the full english batch and uh, you just scan it and you get answers for all the questions 100% in the previous batches uh, we could not provide 100% of the video pods in fr but now we have done 100% except the self practice questions which are like theory and repetitive which we have not even taken in the class so uh, you get to concept books into volumes as in uh, covering the 100% course including all theory chapters you get a uh, striker question bank uh, with all questions of rtp mtp everything till uh, your may 2024 exams with all amendments incorporated and uh, you get a uh, 100% coverage of your syllabus in 200 odd lectures some of our uh, students from the southern part of india wanted demo lectures so i could not uh, i mean it just uh, missed out to share the initial demo lectures so i thought uh, i'll share the demo lecture in fact in fact the last lecture of the class itself which we'll share so we discussed in day 7 cash flow statement and then the theory topic so i'm just uh, putting that adding that lecture here uh, so that what you can do is you can have a look at it in case if somebody wants to understand in terms of how's the language how's the comfort level and all so you can use that as a demo lecture i thought uh, what an idea to just share the last or the second last lecture of the batch as a demo lecture so you can not just see how we started but you can see what was the status when we ended and gives me a better perspective to tell you the exact number of hours and all so with this uh, you can continue watching this particular video with the demo lecture but yes this is your fr full english uh, batch for uh, all you guys i hope you really have a very good learning experience and uh, not just learn well but you also score well after doing this batch all the very best to all of you thank you Hello good morning everyone welcome you back to our batch of CF final with actual reporting in which we are starting today it is seven cash flow statement we completed our index on agriculture and all the questions on that and now let's start with statement of cash flows pretty much similar to what you guys would have discussed in AS3 cash flow statement or the chapter of cash flow statement there isn't really much difference between that and this and uh, the standard again uh, intends to tell you how to prepare a cash flow statement we know in schedule 3 there is no format for cash flow statement given however uh, every company has to prepare a cash flow statement if you are following in days uh, then you have to follow and prepare your cash flow statement as well companies act does provide certain exemptions for preparing cash flow statement to startups and small companies but uh, if you are following in days then obviously in that particular case uh, your applicability is uh, <clears throat> to prepare cash flow statement uh, as per indices in case if you are preparing it so let's first understand what is the indices requiring it says that a company which is presenting cash flow statement should prepare and present it as per this indices that means the standard does not mandate you to prepare cash flow it says that if you are preparing prepare it as per this so there is no mandatory requirement to prepare segment wise cash flow also that means segment wise cash flow is uh, not required you just have to prepare your uh, cash flow statement if any segment is involved in it and you want to give segment wise cash flow that is optional i mean it is up to you the indices does not talks about it for consolidated and separate financial statement cash flow is to be presented for both so number 1 as per indices if you are preparing cash flow then you have to prepare it as per this indices segment wise not mandatory 
Now, if you are preparing, so who's mandatory or who's required to prepare Section 2, Clause 40 of the Companies Act 2013 exempts one person company, small company and dormant company from cash flow statements. So all the other companies have to prepare. And those who have to prepare, they will have to prepare it as per index 7 in case index is applicable on that. Now, let's understand preparation of cash flow statement. Before that, why do we prepare a cash flow statement? Anybody want to give it a try? What is the benefit of a cash flow statement? Tell me, what is the benefit of preparing a cash flow statement? Anybody wants to give it a shot? Cheers. Yeah. Narayan Murthy once said, founder of Infosys, Financial statements are phony, unreal. Only cash is real. He said, if I ask my accountant in a scenario when my company is showing a loss of one rupee and I ask him to do something because of which my company could show a profit of one rupee instead of loss of one rupee without doing anything which is unethical, incorrect. My accountant can do that. He just needs to change some provisions a bit, depreciation or any such thing. And it is possible. But if my cash book shows a balance of 100 rupees, I cannot make it 101. So it is actually your flow of cash which is real reality. So having that notion in mind, you understand the importance of cash flow statement is it basically shows the movement of cash. And hence there is no estimation involved here. So everything what we record here is purely real. So is this a cash book? You can say it is a cash book. But it is a classified cash book. What we do here is that we Classify all our cash inflows and outflows in three segments operating, investing, and financing. So that users may not just know what is the cash inflow and outflow during the year, but they can also know what is the cash inflow and outflow from respective activities. And that will help them to assess the direction and the strength of the company. A company which is having very positive operating cash flows and is having investing outflows and no financing inflow outflow is a company which is in the growth stage, generating a lot of cash, but uh, not uh, sharing much with the fund providers, rather reinvesting. The fund providers may not be really happy because there is no financing outflow there. But the company is going to make more profits because it is reinvesting a bit. A company which is having positive operating cash flows positive financing cash flows and negative investing cash flows means it is making money through operations it is borrowing funds and it is reinvesting it will be under a high growth stage company with negative operating cash flows positive financing cash flows and negligible investing cash flows means the company is suffering losses and is surviving only through taking loans or borrowing or raising funds so it very easily gives you the direction of the company. After all this, let's keep it apart. Just tell us how to prepare cash flow statement because in exam, this is only thing which is relevant. What you've explained us would help you, help us down the line in our career or maybe job interviews, but not in the exams. Very true. So India says when you're preparing cash flow statement, we give you two methods to prepare. One is indirect and one is direct. <clears throat> 
ऑब्वियसली डायरेक्ट मेथड इज वेरी सिंपल इट इज नथिंग बट जस्ट टेक योर कैश बुक एंड इंस्टेड ऑफ अ टी लेजर शेप क्रिएटेड इन टू अ स्टेटमेंट शेप ऑल योर इनफ्लोज एंड आउटफ्लोज रिलेटिंग टू ऑपरेटिंग फाइनेंसिंग इन्वेस्टिंग शुड बी रिक्लासीफाइड इन थ्री कैटेगरीज एंड द टोटल ऑफ योर कैश फ्लो शुड बी एडेड टू ओपनिंग बैलेंस टू गिव यू द क्लोजिंग बैलेंस दैट्स इट सो दी ओनली थिंग विच यू लैव टू रियली डू इज put your effort to classify the cash flows into operating investing and finance which means uh, we need to then study the definitions of operating investing and finance that is the first most critical part of this index then we come to indirect method in which operating cash flows are not shown directly from the cash book but are derived from profit or loss so we take the profit before tax not after tax not oci and from that we adjust all the non sorry all the investing financing activity non cash activity to get operating cash profits so that is the second part of this particular index which you have to discuss and then third part there are certain disclosures which are required which are also equally important for your exam it is a two star standard it is not a one star standard institute does ask you questions from it and uh, the primarily the thing which you have to understand here is first operating investing financing and cash and cash equivalent and then indirect method and then disclosures so let us start our discussion first with the definitions then we'll move forward before we come to definition because we've already studied this in intermediate let me ask you some questions as to how would you classify these activities my question to you is i am giving you four questions <clears throat> a few set of transactions tell me how will you classify it operating financing or investing one i have the uh, jp taken a term loan from bank for uh, acquiring a land a working capital loan taken for business day to day business let's say loan given to subsidiary let's say loan given to employee please tell me how will you classify goods purchased factory purchased machine purchased to manufacture finished goods for sale short term investment in equity shares long term investment in equity shares to 
two months fixed deposit two years 50 let's classify now please understand let us start with the second question first goods purchased are operating activity factory purchased is an investing activity machine purchased is an investing activity you may say, sir, I have purchased this machine which is actually going to be used for the purpose of manufacturing goods, which is a part of my day to day operations. Hence, it should also be operating. So, let's get the first thing clear. There is a difference between operating and ordinary. Many a time, we may get confused between operating and ordinary. Operating means those activities which are principal revenue generating activities of the business whereas ordinary activities are activities which include operating investing and financing all activities which are as a part of day to day operations or are incidental or ancillary activities. So these are activities which are basically part of your day to day operations. Your principal revenue generating activities, your core business activities. Remember, please, that. There is no definition of ordinary activities which is given in the Indies. This term in fact is not used in Indies at all. This term is defined in Indies 7. In accounting standard we used to have an ASI which used to define ordinary and extraordinary activities. Whereas in India's there is no concept of ordinary and extraordinary. There is only one concept of exceptional item which is also not nomenclated as exceptional item. In India's one we discuss that certain cases when the nature of the item, the materiality is such that it needs a separate disclosure you should. And in India's schedule 3 in fact said that if Something has a nature, size, and incidence which is substantial, then should be shown as exceptional item. In fact, I see it clarified in their guidance not or clarification. <clears throat> so if I say that I have acquired a machine just for the purpose of manufacturing goods in the ordinary course of business, acquisition of machine is ordinary but not operating because your core business is not to acquire a machine. That is an investing activity. When you make investments in equity shares, whether it is short term or it is long term, it is an investing activity. So that does not mean that only long term investments are investing activity. But yes, there is an exception that when you make investment in a cash and cash equivalent, it is not treated as investing activity. And Indes defines that an investment which is readily realizable and has insignificant risk of changes in value. Two things, we will understand this, it is all written. Readily realizable as in realizable within a span of three months and as insignificant changes in risk risk in changes in values predefined value is not going to change. Then in that case we will say it is a cash in cash equivalent and not an investment. So it is a movement between cash and cash equivalent. Tell me one thing. If you take your money from one bank account and you put it in another bank account, what impact would it have on your cash flow statement? Nothing. It is nothing but a, a part of your opening and closing cash balances. The only difference is there is a intra transfer within one cash or one bank account to another bank account. This is an interbank transfer, which is an intra transfer for cash equivalents. 
So my total cash equivalents earlier also were the same. Now also they are same because both the bank accounts are part of that cash equivalent. Similarly, cash and FDs up to three months are part of cash and cash equivalent. If you reduce your cash and invested in an FD, it is nothing but an intra cash equivalent transfer, but is not really an activity. So it will be part of cash equivalent. But if it is a two year FD, then usually it will be an investing activity unless you intend to liquidate this FD even in three months if required, which is possible. We will come to that. So with this particular background and my knowledge, see the first term. Term loan from bank acquiring a land is an investing activity. I'm assuming in land is not an asset. Sorry, it is not an inventory for me. I'm not a real estate builder. If that be the case, it could be operating. Working capital loan for business operation. This is a financing activity. My God. First one is also financing. Term loan taken. So it is asking about the loan. So term loan is financing. The second one is also financing. Many a time people may say that this is operating. This is not operating. Why? Is your core business to take loan? No, but we have taken this loan for our core business. That means it is ordinary, but not operating. You took machine for manufacturing goods. It is for your ordinary operation does not mean it is an ordinary operation. It is for your operating activities. Sorry, I should repeat. It is for your operating activities does not mean it is an operating activity. It is an incidental part of your operating activity that if you have to manufacture goods, you will need machine. Buying machine is not day to day business of yours, but it is uh, helpful for conducting the day to day business. So it is incidental and ancillary to it. So it means it is a part of my core business activity or ordinary activity, but not my core business or not my operating activities. So that is why taking loan, whether for business or for PP, everything is treated as financing. Now we have given loan to subsidiary. This is investing. If you have gone, given loan to employee, it will either be investing or operating. Usually an advance given to employee would be operating, but a loan given could be investing. But in CA intermediate books, there is one particular question in which loan given to employee they are treated as operating. It really depends. If it is a part and parcel of your business that, uh, you know, you give loans to employees for three months, six months or so. You can say it is a part of advance. But otherwise, if you are giving a five year loan, it is definitely an investing actor. <laughs> Any which way. So it could be investing or operating depending on what the situation is. Uh, if the question is silent, maybe you will prefer operating. here. Logically, no, but uh, yeah. Depending on the terms. Because see again, loan giving is not a part of your business. It may so happen that it's a policy of the company that company does gives advance to the employees. So advance could be said to be a part of your operating day to day activities. It is very common that we have to give advance to employees. So it's, I mean, debatable. Now, let me ask you another question. Let's say I have purchased a machine on credit. Now I'm waiting for your answer. What activity do you think it is? Machine purchased on credit. Machine purchased on credit. Financing activity. It is not shown at all in cash flow statement as there is no outflow or inflow of cash. Now, creditor for machine pater. 
वी पेड द क्रेडिटर्स फॉर मशीन वॉट विल दिस बी इट विल बी एन इन्वेस्टिंग एक्टिविटी बिटवाई से बैंक लोन usually this happen car purchased for director to 100% bank loan so purchased car and i have taken 100% bank loan so i have not given anything from my pocket bank gave me 10 lakh rupees i gave it to the vendor and i got the car i will pay the bank in future in fact it even doesn't happens like this the bank directly pays to the vendor and we get the car and we are no obligation to pay back to the bank how will this be sure here technically even though direct payment is made but technically there are two cash flows it is investing outflow as well as financing inflow because technically you are taking a loan and then you are giving it to the third party or the person who from whom you are buying the car though the amount may not come in your bank account but principally in substance it is an obligation from one person and a payment done to another now later on when you make so the bank loan repaid so in the bank loan what we have repaid is we have repaid the principal and we have let's say also paid the interest what is that it is a financing activity because simple you took a loan you are repaying it but so what about the interest it should be operating is your business taking loans often no hence interest on that will also not be operating so now things may become a little confusing for you and uh, in fact you should be happy that i have not taken the example for leases let's say i have acquired in a set on lease and then i have paid lease rentals so lease is a special case we will discuss it because technically in lease what happens is initially unless you do any down payment there will be no outflow or inflow it's just that you will get the asset and you have to pay the lease rentals later which will be partly principal and partly interest so for the lessee what it would be for the lesser what it would be interesting case now please tell me with these questions are you just able to kind of think aloud what is this particular standard all about so my objective of starting any particular standard usually is first let's open up our mind to what the standard is going to offer in terms of what are we actually what is the problem which we are trying to solve and if you have got some idea about it and now you are thinking aloud your mind is working and thinking in this direction okay there is going to be an issue in terms of how to classify an activity between operating investing financing i think we have one job done that we have at least started thinking about it and we are not taking this in days just for granted as in oh my god it's a intermediate ah, light light started so before i start with definitions let me please tell you some fundamentals which are more of sj tips rather than given in the indices non cash transaction which have no inflow outflow of cash are not presented at all in the cash flow statement <clears throat> anything which has no inflow or outflow of cash in substance so the bank loan firm car actually in substance had inflow of cash 
So, but something like a finance lease has no inflow flow of cash unless there is a down payment. So, if there is no inflow flow of cash, please understand it will have no effect in cash flow statement. This one simple statement is going to help you out with a lot of transactions which you might be with your common sense attempted incorrectly. I'm not saying this is a standard very important for MCQs, but if in case you get MCQs, please understand MCQs are going to be something like the examples which you have just taken and they'll ask you what should be the impact of these things on cash flow state. So unless you are like just like that, you are able to understand the transaction and the flow and to how to present in cash flow statement, you will not be able to attempt it. So please get these fundamentals right. These are very helpful in understanding the index and solving the MCQ. Number one, no cash inflow outflow, no presentation in the cash flow statement. So let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Conversion of debentures or preferences to equity shares. What impact will it have on your cash flow statement? Nothing. Nothing at all because <clears throat> there is no inflow or outflow of cash. Whereas if these debentures were redeemed, it would be a financing outflow. Next. Cash flow statement is classified based on nature of transaction. Obviously. <clears throat> Any moment in cash and cash England are not presented in cash flow statement. As they represent cash management activity. So we do not show bank account one balance and bank account two balance. They are all part of cash in cash equivalent. So any change within two bank account balances are not going to cumulative change your cash in cash equivalent. So we don't present it at all. Remember our idea is to present cash flows of the year or period. Segregated classified based on the activities. There is no intention to present or reconcile all changes in the balance sheet and financial statement. A very powerful statement. What I am trying to mean with this is please do not think that every transaction like in financial statement should be presented. It should also be presented in cash flow statement because we have been studying financial statements all this while. You may have this notion that you know if there is some financial transaction happening it should get reflected in cash flow statement that's not the objective let's say a company has invested 500 crore rupees in a new plant and all this investment which it has done is on credit means it has not paid a single penny for it and is going to pay it later maybe the government has given one year credit period to pay there is no government grant involved you might feel that in this year, sir said that cash flow statement will represent where is the direction of the company going. So if the company is made of 500 crore of investment, if we don't show in the cash flow statement, how will people know the direction of the company? So please understand that is not what cash flow statement is about. Cash flow is how is the direction of the company considering only the cash flows. So even if the company is made 500 crore of investment, but it is made on credit, no payment has been made, it will not be shown in cash flow statement. Only when you pay is when we show it in the cash flow statement. So please understand the objective is not to show every transaction in cash flow, but only to present cash flows in the cash flow statement. Sometimes things could be so very obvious. Cash flow statement means cash flows. But we may still get confused in that. That is why I'm kind of <clears throat> reiterating, re-emphasizing on it. <clears throat> nice so now let's come to these definitions what are these definitions let's first start with operating activities these are principal revenue producing activities of the business which are termed as operating activities which means your core business activity, the one which you do to basically generate your revenue for whatever purpose you are. Principal revenue producing activities of the business. So these are core operating activity, purchase of goods, sale of goods, salary paid, advertisement done. 
in fact india also says that many a times as a part of your policies of credit sales or credit purchase you may have to pay some late payment interest or give discount on early payment or charge interest on late payment from debtor straight receivables though the term used there is interest but still it is a part of your principal revenue generating activity because the objective there is not really to earn interest the objective is basically to just to ensure that we have smooth operations we get money on time otherwise we charge late interest. so these are all part of your principal revenue generating activity but sometimes you may get confused is this really a principal revenue generating activity or financing or invest so indes additionally says that if any activity is not classifiable anywhere else show it as a part of operating activity the best example of it is taxes paid See, let's understand. If you pay taxes, tell me, on what are you paying taxes? Profits. What are profits made up of? Income minus expense. Which expense are reduced from profits? Means a uh, operating expense. No. If you are taking a loan for business, that interest is also reduced from your profit from business or profession head, and taxes are paid in that of it. whether that loan is interest paid is either on working capital loan or even on assets because in assets also once the asset is ready to use put to use thereafter if you pay any interest on that that is not treated as a part of cost of the asset but is treated as an expense even in income tax so income tax does not charges profits or taxes in the head of profit from business or profession from your operating profits only but it considers you or allows you a deduction for all your expenses even if they are financing in nature hence you really will not be able to segregate your taxes as to to what extent they are relating to operating financing and investing so better if you can't segregate the residuary clauses anything which is not operating investing or financing or cannot be segregated into it put it into operate But yes, in case if you have made a sale of a long-term asset and you have made a capital long-term capital gain on it, or which is separately charged equal to tax at flat twenty percent rate, and you specifically are able to identify that tax expense, you can then put that as a part of investing outflow because it is specifically from investing activities. So anything which is neither operating nor financing nor investing will be treated as a part of operating activity. Residuary clause. Let's say, for example, loss by theft of cash. So, thief came in and he has stolen some cash. Is this your operating activity? No way. Not a day-to-day -day business. Is it your investing, financing? No way. But we have lost cash in cash equivalent. Now, if I don't show this cash flow anywhere. my opening cash balance will not tally with my closing cash balance see movement within cash and cash equivalents are not disclosed but movements between cash and cash equivalent and other items are disclosed here you have reduced your cash because there is a theft but it is not increased your any other cash or cash equivalent balance so you have to show this somewhere in operating investing or financing otherwise your opening closing cash will not whenever you get confused with an example like there's this thing that in the whole year there is this this one transaction which has happened this is the brahmastra technique of solving any individual transaction in cash flow state just think for a moment that's the only transaction which has happened in the year and i have to prepare a statement such that my opening cash balance plus minus my cash flows is equal to closing So let's say the only example or the only transaction which happened in the year is I had a cash balance of ten thousand dollars, which a thief has stolen two thousand. So the closing balance is eight thousand. So in my cash flow statement, my opening cash and cash equivalent is ten, closing is two. That means I have to show cash outflows of two thousand. 
where do I show it? It is not operating investing financing. Hence, it will be shown under operating activity. So if you are preparing under direct method, under operating activity, loss of cash by theft, 2000 rupees you will have to show. Not because it is operating, but because it is not operating investing financing and hence anything which is not classifiable anywhere is classified in operating. So now you can say operating activities are two things. One, principal revenue generating activity and second, residuary activities. We'll take more examples for you. Oh my God, that is too much, sir. Just hold on. Let me, let us consume this. No problem. <sighs> Digest it. <sighs> Oxygen will help you digest it better. Okay, let's move on. Investing activity. These are activities which are related to acquisition or disposal of locked up assets. So here the term used is long term assets. Which could be long term investments. But sir, you said all investment, hold on, we have not completed the definition, it's just starting. So all long term investments, all your PP which are your long term assets, non current assets. Whether you acquire it or you sell it, it is both a part of investing activity. Apart from this, any investment which you do in other than cash in cash equivalent. So let's say for example, a short term investment, which is not a cash in cash equivalent, is an investing activity. So six months FD usually will be an investing activity, a three month FD could be a cash in cash equivalent. We will discuss that further. Investment in equity shares for short term is investing activity because it is not classified as cash in cash equivalent. Why we will discuss it when we study cash equivalent definition. Plus any interest dividend etc on that. So remember if a set is an investing activity, any interest income and dividend income on that is also investing activity and not operating. So tell me one thing. If you have done a six months fixed deposit, what is it? Investing activity. So interest on this FD, what will it be? Investing activity. If you have done a three months fixed deposit, it will be no activity. But a movement between cash and cash equivalent. Hence, no disclosure needed in CFS, not consolidated cash flow state. But what about interest on this FD? Now I'll wait for your answer. Tell me, what will you do for interest on this FD? Come on. Come on, guys. You need to respond now. This is farewell time. We're just nearing the end of the batch. <clears throat> what will be the interest on empty? So you understand uh, cash and cash equivalent briefly I've told you a three months realizable investment is treated as cash equivalent. More than that is investing. 
So six months FD would be usually a investing activity. So interest on investing activity is also investing. But now I'm talking about an investment which is for three months, which is not investing but cash equivalent. Now if it is a cash equivalent, the next question which comes up is, I will earn interest because I've done FD for three months, so there will be interest. Will it be shown in cash flow statement anywhere or will it not be? Now you may give an answer that sir, it will not be shown in the cash flow statement at all. But please understand once again, I told you whenever you get a question like this, just assume this is the only transaction during the year. So tell me if you're opening cash and cash balance was one lakh. You made a three years, three months FD on it, sorry. After three months, you get, you got, let's say 2000 rupees interest. So you're closing cash and cash equivalent will be one lakh two thousand. So opening one lakh, closing one lakh two thousand, opening closing is not matching. You have to show cash flows of two thousand somewhere. Where will you show it? So is it an investing activity? No. Is it financing? Definitely not. I have not borrowed it. Is this an operating activity? My principal revenue generating activity? No. Interest is not my principal business. So we will still have to show it as an operating activity. Why under the residuary class? Very good. Very well, nice. People have given this answer. <clears throat> so then now this brings me to financing activities. Any activity which changes the size and composition of the borrowings or equity and interest dividend on them is financing activity. So Anything that changes your borrowings or equity. Now remember, these are not long term borrowings. It is long term or short term. Please understand. Long term assets was given in investing activity. Investment in other than cash equivalent is given in investing activity. But in financing, it is not long term loan or borrowings, all borrowings. So even working capital loans are also financing activity. They are also financing activities. In fact, if you have paid any dividend distribution tax on equity or preference dividend, even that is a financing activity because that is specifically relatable to your financing activity. However, DDT is now abolished, but just for the sake of explanation. So what about compound financial instruments? They are completely financing because a part of them is equity and a part of them is financing. Sorry, debt. Now, whether it is equity or it is debt, it is ultimately a part of financing. So any compound financial instrument raised will be financing. Any outflow on that will be financing. Sir, outflow will we take effective interest rate or will we take actual outflow? Come on, give me a break. Guys, we are discussing cash flow statement. We only see cash movement. So the actual cash outflow which happens in a compound financial instrument will be treated as an <clears throat> financing activity. So simple. So compound financial instrument are not going to give you a trouble because the classification between liability and equity is not relevant because in both the cases it will be still a part of financing activities. Yo. Next. <clears throat> cash means cash and demand deposits. Demand deposits any kind of deposit which I can withdraw on demand, which could be current account balance are also as good as cash because it is withdrawable. Remember, this will also include any foreign currency in hand. Obviously, that is also treated as currency cash. So why have you written that separately? Maybe there is some reason we'll come to that. Before that, what is cash equivalent? These are short term, highly liquid asset can be realized in determined amounts of money and have insignificant risk of changes in market. <clears throat> highly liquid ICI has clarified. If it is realizable within three months, it is treated as highly liquid. Now, please understand, we've already done this discussion in days one, schedule three. This was initial days of the class when we started the batch. And today we are standing on a day where we are just about to complete it, about to. That day we discussed that current assets include any particular assets which are realizable 12 months after the balance sheet or reporting period, from the end of the reporting period. <clears throat> so please understand, <clears throat> 
if you have done a six months FD, it is a current asset, but not a cash equivalent. In order to classify any asset as cash equivalent, it should be realizable in three months usually. So please understand it is not just cash equivalents which are current assets. Cash equivalents are current assets, but they are not the only current asset. A six months FD is a investing outflow in cash flow statement, but it will be a current asset in the balance sheet. So these are two independent classifications. <clears throat> so cash equivalents are short term, three months, highly liquid, readily realizable, usually not more than three months. So you can say ICS clarified short term, highly liquid means usually realized in three months. And they can be realized in determined amounts. Determined amounts as in basically what, let's say an FD with fixed interest or if not fixed, a predefined interest rate. Or let's say a bond with fixed interest. But definitely not an equity share. Why? Because an equity share may be short term highly liquid if it is listed, but cannot be realized in determined amounts. Why cannot be realized in determined amount? Obviously, equity share value will keep on changing and it is not predefined as to what we will receive, which means they have significant risk of changes in market prices. So anything which has market price changing is not a cash equivalent. And that is why I told you foreign currency is a part of cash and cash equivalent because foreign currency is not cash equivalent, it is cash. You may say, sir, foreign currency also has values fluctuating. So then how is it a cash and cash equivalent? No, sir, we don't think so much. So you don't worry about it. Whatever you say, we just accept. Well, you should and you will when you study your device. <clears throat> and many a time students do give this feedback. So with your classes, many a times we just think about, okay, what about this? And then a few while later, uh, you cover those things up. So this is basically, we've learned the long, hard way through experiences and doubts of the students itself. So we have developed our own artificial intelligence about your doubts with uh, these many years of teaching. So, I mean, these are too many concepts, one after the other bombarded, but I'll conclude it, don't worry. Summarize it, don't worry. So when we talk about cash, we don't think whether it has risk of changes in value. Cash is cash. But when we talk about cash equivalent, yes, only those things which have no significant risk of changes in value are treated as cash equivalent. So if your company has excess cash and it invests in gold, assuming that the price of gold is increasing, so we'll invest there. Gold may be a highly liquid asset. It's not a financial asset. I know it's a commodity, but it's a highly liquid asset. Can be readily realized. I mean, gold sometimes could be even more <clears throat> realizable than cash. You may find difficulty to use your rupee currency in a foreign country, but if you have gold, you can get it in cash anywhere across the globe. It is readily realizable, but it has significant risk of changes in value and hence it is not a cash equivalent. Because it is not a cash equivalent, but your investment, it will be treated as a part of your investing activity. There's just one specific point which you have to keep in mind, which is a negative current account balance which is basically nothing but like a temporary overdraft or overdrawn bank account is treated as a part of cash and cash equivalent and cash flow statement even if it is shown as a current liability in financial statements balance sheet. 
We have discussed this in India's one schedule three also. Now please understand bank overdraft are of two nature. Bank overdrafts could be of two nature. One is a bank overdraft which you have sanctioned. So let me take a few examples of bank overdraft. Number one, OD against FD, which is one of the most common ways. You put an FD in a bank and you take an overdraft against it. So that what happens is you keep on getting your interest. Whenever you need money, you withdraw. OD against a FD. Second is a, a loan sanctioned in the form of overdraft or cash credit limit, which is nothing you've given some security against which you've given been opened a bank account and it says you can take this bank account to negative five crores which is your limit sanctioned limit. And third is simply overdrawn current accounts. So many a times uh, if I am a bank customer and I have a lot of facilities and other things from the bank, bank usually may allow temporary overdraft, like, let's say up to 5 lakh, 10 lakh rupees in my account, saying that, okay, you are a usual customer, so we'll allow. Many a times you are allowed overdraft against a check in clearing and all. These are all temporary in nature. Time being in nature. Please understand these two are treated as part of financing activities. Whereas this is treated as cash and cash equivalent negative balance. It will Included in cash and cash equivalent in negative. Though in the balance sheet, they are all shown as liabilities. But in cash flow statement, the presentation is there. I hope this is clear to everybody. That's it. So what we have discussed till now is basically the methods, uh, sorry, not the methods, the definition of operating, investing, financing, and cash in cash equivalent, and the principles behind this index, based on which we will try to have or solve some questions. In these questions, in some cases, there is an ambiguity. Point. We will discuss those ambiguities as well. <clears throat> Company is provided following information for various assets held by it on 31st March 2017, and of which of the following item will be part of cash cash equivalents for preparation of cash flow state. So the question specifically asks you as to which will be a part of cash and cash. You just have to say yes or no. Government bonds, so what is this bond? It's a 5% yani, as in predefined interest rate. Eh? Open-ended, which means you can exit any point of time. The main purpose is to park excess funds for temporary period. Is it a cash and cash equivalent? I guess so. Why? Because it is a predefined fixed interest rate. Readily realizable. You can uncash it at any point of time. And your intention is also the same. Now, whether intention matters, let's also talk about it. <clears throat> let's say I have done an FD for three years, but the management intends to liquidate as necessary. And I'll just take a realistic example for you. <clears throat> I don't know if you have 
heard about sweep in FTs. So what I've done is <clears throat> I have opened up a bank account with Central Bank of India current account for my business. Now current account usually will not give me any interest. So Central Bank has recently launched a new scheme wherein they say that if your bank balance goes above rupees 2 lakh, we will create a fixed deposit of it. If it goes above 2 lakhs, we will create a fixed deposit. Of the excess money in your account for one year. And if you, in case, issue any check and your bank balance is 2 lakh rupees, and the check is of 3 lakh rupees. What we will do is we will immediately liquidate that FD and we will transfer back the funds of the FD to your bank account. So your check will get cleared, it is that your FD would be broken in between. Now we did the FD for one year. Let's say after three months itself you issued a check because of which this FD had to be broken. So we will give you interest as applicable on a three months FD. The normal interest rate for a 3 month FD let's say was 4%, we will just give you 3.5%, a little lesser, as in whatever, but you will get interest. Technically speaking, at the end of the balance sheet, sorry, at the end of the financial year on the balance sheet date, let's say I had a balance of 2 lakh current account and 8 lakh rupees of FD. Because it was uh, excess balance automatically transferred to FD. This 8 lakh of FD is made over a period of time. Some FD, all FDs are for one year, but some FDs have already completed six months, some have completed two months, some have just been made. Should I treat this 8 lakh rupees as an investing activity or the FDs which were for six months already completed FD, uh, or three months already completed as investing activity? No. Please understand two important things. Number one, your classification of operating, investing and financing happens on the date of transaction and not later. So whether it is operating or investing or financing is to be decided when the transaction was done. So today if an FD is six months old, it is an investing activity. No, please. You have to see when that FD was made at that date, what was it classifiable as? Next. On that date, it was made a one year FD, so is it a long term investment? Yes. But honestly, in substance, do you really intend to use it as a long term investment? No. We intend to use it whenever needed. That is why India's ICI has clarified that <clears throat> whenever management intends to liquidate funds whenever needed for business, even if the FD is for more than three months. Treat your deposits as cash and cashy, which is substance over form. So management, judgment and intention will matter. Also, please note down one thing that classification as Investing, financing, operating, cash and cash equivalent is done when the transaction is executed or let's say when the cash flows happen. And not revised later. There is no concept of Revising. Whenever cash flows happen, you decide where will it be classified. You don't revise it later. So a long term asset you had acquired, but let's say you acquired a PP for long term. After three months, you're not happy, so you sold it. That does not mean it will be shown as an 
operating activity in your business at the end of the year. When you acquired, you acquired it for long term. It is an investing activity. When cash flow, everything is to be classified based on the date when the cash flows happen. Second. <coughs> In standing in March 2017, FD with SBI 12% three-year maturity for January 2020. Cash and cash equivalent usually no. Why usually? Because unless the entity intends to liquidate it whenever necessary, then it could be cash and cash equivalent. Fixed deposit with HDFC 10% original term was two years, but due date on maturity is three months from the balance sheet date. I'm waiting for your answer. What would you say in this case? Please tell me. <coughs> hmm. Please tell me. So I think by now you have understood the approach also. We don't study any of the index. By okay, index seven cash flow statement. Let's start with definition. No. Our objective is not to solve limited questions which are available. Our objective is to understand the index so that you don't have to memorize anything, but you learn and by your own logical sense you can answer all the questions. That is why invest so much time in concept building of any particular stunt. And then we start doing the questions. When we do the questions, we don't uh, find a situation where we'll find anything which is new, different from what we've done. We have done everything and we should be able to solve every question. But still, we may get some questions wrong the very first place because unless and until you do the questions, whatever you learn, unless you until you understand applying it, I mean, you're not there. Irrespective of how much do you see people driving the car, you cannot learn unless you drive it yourself. And it takes time. Over a period of time, once you practice, you're very comfortable with it. And then once you've learned it well, you don't forget things. Even if you don't drive for a while. That logic. Now we've studied the concept, you're well poised to answer it. Now tell me in this case, it is three months from the balance sheet date, redeemable. It was originally done for two years. When did you do the FD two years? One year, nine months ago. That time was your intention to liquidate it in within three months. Usually we will not assume this. So that time it was your investing activity. So we will say usually it is not. So what we can say is it is not a cash in cash equivalent. Unless The management has a policy to liquidate. Early on requirement of funds. So this is not a cash in cash. You will be surprised. In this particular case, the institute had initially given an answer include and they had given this explanation that it will be included because the remaining term is three months and I told them what are you doing so I had raised this particular issue with them that these answers are wrong and then we got it revised redeemable preference shares in ABC I mean, redeemable preference shares usually will not be liquidatable immediately whenever you want to. We don't assume that you've just done it today and it will be redeemed after one month, so it is three months readily realized. We we'll usually say no. Cash balances, Indian bank, foreign bank, or foreign branch of Indian bank. Bank overdraft of SBI, Ford branch, temporary overdraft payable on demand. Yes, part of cash, cash equivalent, negative. OD facility for working capital purpose. It is a sanctioned loan, no financing active. Treasury bill 90 bill. These are basically government securities, which are having no risk of changes in value. 
they get you a fixed rate of interest and is very secure because it is 90 days yes now here again there is an issue units of mutual fund it's an open-ended scheme so it is repayable on demand whenever you want main purpose was to reach short-term gains by leveraging the great term capital market so we have done this because there is a dip in capital market so we have invested it here now see please understand if it's a debt based fund maybe yes But if it is equity based, definitely no. It says exclude if significant risk of changes in value exist. So we got these particular answers revised. They earlier said that this will be included. How come it will be included? If it is a mutual fund of equity, it has a significant risk of changes in value. Even if it is readily realizable, it cannot be a part of cash equivalence because there should be no significant risk of changes in value. noise what will be the classification of following items for bank financial institution of a bank and financial institution loan given taken all will be treated as a part of it. so loan given taken for customers will be part of operating activity but if they have taken loan not from customer but let's say from banks other banks or rbis and all then it will become part of their financing activity so let's do it Interest received on loan and advance is given. I am talking about bank and financial institutions and others. Operating, but it is interest received on loans and advance is given. Investing. Interest paid on deposits and other borrowings. Operating and this will be financing paid. Interest and dividend received on investment in subsidy associates and other subsidy. Now investment in subsidy obviously for bank also is an investing activity because it is not custom. Dividend paid on preference and equity share excluding tax on dividend paid on preference and equity share by other entities. Oh, sorry, including tax. It is all financing for both. Finance charges paid by lessee under a finance lease. Okay, so finance lease is special, but just for the moment, just understand it, sir. Financing activity. However, please also understand it is a financing activity because you have paid finance charges. If you would have received finance charges from a borrower, then maybe in case of bank, it could be a customer because bank may be into leasing services. But you don't, I mean, you have taken a and a set on finance lease and you're paying money to them it is definitely a financing outflow it's a special case we still to discuss this special cases we'll discuss payment towards reduction of outstanding finance lease liability so any liability you're paying it's a financing activity for sure interest paid to vendor for acquiring fixed asset under deferred payment basis so we paid interest to vendor but we have got on deferred payment basis now what is deferred payment basis means we've basically taken a financing from the vendor itself so if you have taken financing from the vendor itself uh, it is like you know kind of a manufacturer dealer lesser financing it will be a financing out principal sum payment under deferred payment basis for acquisition of a set will be an investing activity so you have taken on credit an asset and you are paying it it is an investing out Penal interest from customers, if it is from customers, should be operating. I just told you an example. Suppliers, again, an operating. It's an operating inflow, it's an operating. Interest paid on delayed tax payment. Tax payment usually are operating because not classifiable specifically. And hence, uh, tax refunds will also be operating. So the last four are operating. This is a nice question. Important, you can mark up. How's it going, guys? <clears throat> so this is the way you will have to classify. Classify. Operating, investing, financing, cash in, cash equivalent. And these are the logics which you will have to use. Okay. Anybody has any doubts, please ask me. 
Else we are done with the first part of the standard, which is the definitions for investing, operating, financing, and cash equivalents. Now we have to discuss second part, which is method, primarily indirect method, because direct is straightforward. Any doubts? <clears throat> Any doubts? Okay, board notes to be updated right away. Thing you wanted before the break, right? Any other doubts? No doubts. No. So let's come to our uh, discussion on the methods. Boys and girls. When you have to prepare cash flow statement under direct method, it is plain vanilla. Just assume whatever would be there in the cash book. Inflow, outflow, classify them into investing, operating, financing, cash equivalent, and then just uh, put a summary cash flows from operating, investing, and financing. That's not something which is really going to create any botheration. You just have to remember one thing if it is coming in the cash book, it is being or it will be shown in the cash flow statement. The problem comes in when we have an indirect method. Because an indirect method <clears throat> which is used by listed entities because SEBI requires listed entities to prepare cash flow statement and present using indirect method. Indes does not specifically says you have to use either direct or indirect. You can use any, but SEBI says to listed company. So in indirect method also, it is only the operating activities which are shown indirectly. These two are same, direct. So talking about operating activities, how do we start? So let me first tell you the objective of indirect method. The objective of indirect method is so that users just don't know the cash flows, but they are also able to relate those cash flows of yours to your p and because you know what people do is people whenever they see two documents or two statements which represent the same information which is your transactions of the year, events of the year, conditions of the year they wish to reconcile them but if they don't get reconciled they really don't get that confidence that uh, these things are actually correct or man equally matching equally and so Hence, uh, if we prepare cash flow statement using indirect method, we start first from profits, which are shown in the PNL. The index does not tell you that you have to use profit after tax or before tax, continuing or all operation. It simply says you start with profits. It is your choice. However, usually we start with profit before tax. Now see how to prepare cash flow statement under operating activity method. Oh, sorry, under indirect method for operating activities when you are starting with profit before tax. The first logic which you will have to settle in your minds is We have to start from profits and we have to reach to cash flows from operating activity. So, 
so what we will have to do is we, we should ideally remove any income in included in profits that are not operating in nature so that we'll get profits from operating activity but then we'll also have to add back all expenses which are already deducted in profits which are not operating in nature but do you know what is this going to give you it is actually going to give you your operating profits but i don't need operating profits i need operating cash flows so what i'll have to do is from these operating profits because i don't need operating profits i need operating cash flows all i have to do tell me so from profits if you have to calculate the cash flows what you will have to do is you will have to basically <clears throat> adjust or non cash items which are included in these operating profits so let's say this is 1 this is 2 this is 3 this is 4 and this is 5 you'll have to adjust non cash items which are included in 4 and you'll also have to do working capital changes adjustment as in basically profits incomes or expenses that have not generated cash or used cash during the year which could be plus and minus both this is something which is going to give you cash flows from operating it <clears throat> but if in case suppose your profits were before tax so these will also be before tax so what you will have to do is then you will also have to deduct excess paid or any such item which is not uh, already adjusted here now please understand what i am trying to say i am trying to not tell you what is the format but i am trying to derive the format the logic is number 1 <clears throat> we start with profits now please understand your profits could include profits like interest income from investments which are investing activity so because these profit include that income which is not operating we will reduce those profit incomes it could include interest expense on borrowings which is not a part of your operating profit so we will add it back because it has reduced my profit but please understand in 2 and 3 my question is question number 1 whether tax expense is added back under point number 3 and the answer is no as only those non operating expense let's say tax expense on 
I have a specific tax expense on long term capital gain. Whether it is added back in three because it is non operating. The answer is still no, as only those non operating expenses are added that are already excluded from profits at point one. Now please understand. If the company says my profit before tax is one crore, which is obviously before tax meaning tax on operating activity, even long term capital gain tax, it is before tax. And I have paid a long term capital gain tax of five lakh. <clears throat> now, in this one crore of profit before tax, I have not reduced the five lakh rupees long term capital gain tax. So I will not add it back also. Because you might say that, oh my God, this is a tax which is not operating specifically. It will be treated as a part of investing activity. So we should add it back here. But please understand your starting point is profit before tax. That means in that profit, these tax are not already deducted. So why are you adding it back? To understand, it's like, you know, in partnership, you have studied closing capital is given and you have to calculate opening capital and they give you drawings of the year capital introduced during the year. But tell me if they say from this closing capital, capital calculate opening capital <clears throat> and the closing capital is given before adjusting current year profits or before current year profits. So to calculate opening capital, if the question gives you current year profit, will you do any adjustment for it? No, <clears throat> because this closing capital is only after additions and drawings of the current year and before current year profits. So if you have to derive opening capital, what you will do is you will just adjust what is already adjusted from closing capital, but was not a part of the opening capital. That means you will add back drawings of the year and you will deduct additions during the year to get opening capital. That's it. Similarly, if you start with profit before tax, any taxes are not excluded from your profit. They are not uh, reduced from your profit. So you cannot add it back. Next, in the taxes paid, point number eight. Whether it will be included in eight number point. So the answer to that is it will not be a part of eighth point. As only taxes paid which are classifiable as operating activity are reduced. So now this is getting a little tricky. But uh, the nature of adjustments could be so many that unless and until you really understand it from the perspective of logics, cause and effect, you will not be able to handle every particular transaction more than that MCQs in the exams. Because you will have to be thinking like this. It is pretty logical boys and girls. You've already calculated cash flows from operating activity before tax. You can say here onwards it has become like a direct method. <coughs> so taxes paid will be only taxes paid which are not investing or financing specifically. Why are we deducting that? Because in operating cash flows you have to reduce taxes other than investing in financing. <coughs> And they are not already deducted from profit before tax. Cash flows from operating. The basic logic is what we do is we start with profits. Usually it could be before tax. In this, all non cash expenses will be added back. Non cash income should be reduced. Similarly, any non operating income or expense will be added or reduced. Any income reduced, any expense added back. Provided they are already debited or credited to PRL and have already been adjusted from this. This is all investing financing. Changes in working capital are taken to identify that out of your profits, what are the extent of profits which are not realized in cash? 
so the logic is if your opening datas were 100 and closing datas are 150 it means out of the current year cash flows from operating activity which will include sale of goods 50 rupees you've not been able to in cash because your datas have net increased by 50 so what you will do is whatever are your profits for the current year represents your cash flows from operating activities net cash flows from operating activity you will reduce it by 50 because that is the amount of increase in current asset means that amount of cash you've not been able to create in the current year so the simple logic is you increase any of your sorry you any increase in current asset <clears throat> will be reduced similarly if your liabilities have gone down you will reduce it because that would have led to a cash outflow so your opening creditors are 100 closing creditors are zero that means your current year paid 100 rupees of your last year creditors they are not a part of your current year expense but it has led to a cash outflow so introduce it so the logic is simple if the liabilities go down reduce your cash flows if the assets go up reduce your cash flow if the liabilities go up increase your cash flow if the assets go down increase your cash this is before cash tax cash flows taxes paid only from operating activity you get cash flows from operating activity <clears throat> now believe me this is also not very plain vanilla and direct this is also very interesting so let me ask you a few questions on this question number one I've already asked you. Question number two. Let's build the concepts first. Then we'll come to the questions. And it's going to be tricky, huh? it's not going to be easy. Bad debts on trade receivables of thousand would be reflected in cash flow state operating activity indirect method under which head you just have to give me the number so will it be included under so okay forget about one two three four five will it be part of two or three or five or six or eight <clears throat> tell me tell me where will you reflect bad debts of 1000 rupees on trade receivables in indirect method cash flow statement? Just tell me 23568. Sometimes students say, sir, it will be reflected as a part of five non cash items. So, see, definitely it is not a non operating income or expense because it is operating trade receivable. But it's a non-cash item. So you might think of include it in non-cash item. Point number five. But it is not the correct answer. The point is six. Why? Please understand. <clears throat> your opening data or trade receivables were 1000. Let's say your closing data trade receivables are nil. Okay. And let's assume there are, this is primarily due to bad debts of 1000 and there are no other transactions during the year. I'm just telling you how to think. There are no other transactions during the year. This is it. That's it. Now just think what should be your cash flows from operating activities. It should be nil. Why? Because there is no cash flow, nothing have I received during the year. What should be your profit before tax? It should be minus 1000 due to bad debts. 
So from minus 1000, if I have to bring it to nil, what I should do? I will have to add 1000 in it. Now see, current asset reduced are added. Now, if I also include it as a part of non-cash expense bad debt, it will lead to double counting. So then it will bring it to plus 1000, which is not correct. So I'll have to exclude it from here. This <clears throat> brings me to the first tip. Any item which affects current asset or liability, never include it as a part of non-cash item. So what basically comes as a part of non-cash item is only depreciation, amortization, impairment of assets. Because these are those expenses which are not non-operating expense, not working capital affecting, but are to be added back to get the operating cash profit or cash flows. Let's take a break, otherwise this will be too much and then we'll do it after the break. Chali, so now let's continue our discussion. Uh, what we were discussing last or just before the break was bad debts. Bad debts, what we discussed was, so you may have this notion that bad debt is a non-cash expense, which it is because there is no cash outflow. In fact, uh, the receivables are reducing. But if you treat it as a part of non-cash expense, so it will also be considered in debtors because in debtors treat current assets you simply say or you take the difference of the closing and the opening balance now when you take this difference of closing and opening balance you will otherwise see that your debtors have reduced due to bad debts which means current assets have reduced which will lead to a adjustment to your operating profits by increasing them to calculate the operating cash flows because it will otherwise be a part of your current assets and liabilities adjustment. You cannot again include it as a part of non-cash. And that is why please understand non-cash will not include any non-cash expense relating to any current asset or current liability. So it is only depreciation, amortization, impairment, which are treated as a part of non-cash expenses, which are already reduced from your profits will be added back. Number one. Number two. Let me ask you another question now. <clears throat> now, let's say we had taken a bank loan, ten percent bank loan, ten lakh. Your interest expense is 1 lakh. Your opening outstanding interest was nil. And your closing outstanding interest is 1 lakh. Which is this is due but not paid. <clears throat> How will you present this in the cash flow statement? whether it will be included as a non-operating expense added back of 1 lakh which is interest expense or current liability increase added to operating cash flows of 1 lakh. And the question itself gives you the answer. See, you may say that outstanding interest is a current liability. Now, if I say it is a current liability, we know any increase in current liability <laughs> will increase your cash flows. Now, if you add it here as increase in current liability added to cash flows, what will happen? You know, it will lead to double adjustment. Number one, your profits, let's say for the year you made a profit of 6 lakh rupees after interest. So before interest it was 7 lakh. So your operating cash flow should be 7 lakh. So you did 6 lakh profit before tax, after interest expense. Now here you will remove any 
इनकम एंड यू एड एनी एक्सपेंस विच आर नॉट ऑपरेटिंग दिस इज अ फाइनेंसिंग एक्सपेंस यू लाइट इट सो फ्रॉम सिक्स लैख प्रॉफिट वन लैख इंटरेस्ट एक्सपेंस वेन यू एड यू से प्रॉफिट आर सेवन लैख Now, if you further say there is a current liability change that your liability has increased by one lakh, it will lead to further increase, which is not correct because you just need to adjust it once. That is why the other important tip, which you should remember in preparing cash flow statement, is in current asset and current liabilities, we will only consider those items which are operating in nature. so you should not include any changes in current asset liability relating to non operating current assets liabilities activities like interest creditors for pp because they are otherwise adjusted under non operating activities so if you remember these two basic things it will help you a lot to not do any wrong calculations but get things appropriately and correctly so the indirect method of cash flow statement primarily is nothing but identifying which adjustments should be adjusted as what the logic is very simple non operating activities show under non operating and not working capital changes so any outstanding liabilities relating to it will not be a part of working capital changes then anything which affects your current assets or liability working capital will not be included in non cash or non operating so that there is no double counting for one single adjustment this is the logic with this you should be now in the position to do your calculations with respect to operating and non operating sorry operating cash flows under indirect method now based on this uh, we can take a set of questions however there are some special discussions which are done which we'll have to understand uh, in order to do all the questions let's try one question first a firm has a five year bond of another company face value 10 lakh and we paid 5 lakh to acquire it the effective interest rate is 15% so it's a deep discount bond that means the interest rate in this bond is 0% it is uh, acquired at 5 lakh and it will be redeemed at 10 lakhs after 5 years which will give you effective 15% per annum interest but no cash flows you record proportionate income in its income statement throughout the period of bond so 5 lakh 15% 75000 then 5 lakh 75000 15% like this in 5 years it will go to 10 lakhs you have to answer how interest income will be treated in cash flow statement during the period of bond So obviously this income there is no cash flow during the period. Of the bond, so it should not be included in operating or investing activities. On maturity, ten lakh should be split between interest, income, and receives from investment activity. So obviously this ten lakh rupees full is your investing outflow. Oh, sorry, investing inflow. Should we give a bifurcation within disclosure whether a bifurcation is required? so whether a bifurcation is required so the answer is uh, we will discuss so as i told you disclosure and special issues are to be discussed we will discuss that but yes the answer is yes so no big deal i mean pretty straightforward let's come to this <clears throat> During 1920, Akola has paid various taxes and reproduced the below information. Capital gain tax 20 crore on sale of office premises and a sale consideration of 100 crore. So this 20 crore will be treated as investing outflow. 100 is investing inflow because it is specifically relating to sale of long-term assets. 
थ्री करोड़ ऑन बिजनेस प्रॉफिट ऑफ थर्टी करोड़ एज यूम एंटायर बिजनेस प्रॉफिट एज कैश प्रॉफिट दिस विल बी ऑपरेटिंग आउटफ्लो डिविडेंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन टैक्स ऑन डिविडेंड ट्वेंटी टू शेयर होल्डर्स बोथ ऑफ दिस टेन ट्वेंटी करोड़ एंड टैक्स ऑन इट ऑफ टू करोड़ इज फाइनेंसिंग आउट इनकम टैक्स रिफंड ऑपरेटिंग इन फ्लो बिकॉज इट वॉज अर्लियर ऑल्सो ऑपरेटिंग दैट्स इट दिस इज वॉट इज गिवन cool so now let us discuss the third part of this index which is all these special treatments on the disclosures and then we'll be done with the index then we should be in the position to try questions so important aspects and disclosures first cash and cash equivalent we have discussed these are readily realizable within 90 days 3 months is what i told you then they are cash and cash equivalent this is ici clarified overdraft classification if it is a sanctioned limit financing activity negative current account balance then it is shown as current liability in balance sheet but negative cash and cash equivalent in cash flow we have discussed this any gain loss income expense on cash equivalent will be operating activity residuary clause i talked about interest on a 3 months fd foreign currency cash in hand bank balance on demand or part of cash fd up to 3 months definitely is equivalent but if you have an fd which is for more than 3 months but recoverable on demand and intend to recover then to cash equivalent government treasury bonds mutual funds and all could be cash equivalent if they have insignificant risk of changes in value but gold equity shares of listed company though they are liquid but have significant risk of changes in value hence not cash equivalent so we have discussed all this it is all given also in the notes i mean the book so it should be not that we've discussed but where is it asset taken on finance i told you that we'll do a special discussion if it is taken on credit from supplier there will be no cash flow on the date when we have acquired this asset without paying any money but when we make the payment to creditor it will be an investing outflow but the standard says if you have got it on deferred credit then while making the payment to supplier the interest portion is treated as financing and the principal is treated as investing and this is a special case please mark a star you need to revise this at the end otherwise you may forget the treatment of it so what it is treated as is that it is a transaction which involves both financing and investing out what about finance lease since there are no cash flows on initial recognition you will obviously since there are no cash flows on initial recognition you will obviously do what you will not do or you will not show it anyway but later on you will make lease rental payments which will have principal and interest both both will be treated as financing out so if you compare a c with b you would have said that principal should be investing and the balance should be financing but it is not like that because finance lease the name itself suggests you are financing the complete thing it is like getting finance and usually we have seen that sometimes we go to a plain finance lesser so he is a pure financer like state bank of india other banks that is why the 100% payment is treated as finance if you have raised funds out of a loan obviously the loan inflow will be your financing inflow and the money which you pay for acquiring this is that example what bank loan financed car purchase will be investing inflow sorry investing outflow for car purchasing and financing inflow but then you will be paying money to the banks so it will be all financing outflow both principal plus interest both will be financing out so this is the only special case where we are splitting it any other cases it is purely financing out <clears throat> remember loan taken could be working capital term loan sanctioned bank overdraft these are all part of financing out
taxes we have discussed if it is segregable then we will be shown under respective otherwise operating nice what is tds let's understand let me ask you a question interest on long term investment of 50000 less 5000 tds 45,000 received during the year in cash. How will it be presented in cash flow statement? Think about it. Sir, options, 45,000 investing inflow, in 50,000 investing inflow, 5,000 TDS investing outflow. Or Fifty thousand investing inflow, five thousand operating outflow, which is tax. And the correct answer is A. Cash flow statement is nothing but cash receipt. What is the cash receipt? Forty five thousand. So show forty five thousand as investing inflow. That's it. Finish. So for TDS, you don't show or present it as gross TDS separately. Simple. If any receipt is net of TDS shown in cash flow statement at the net amount only, just show the actual cash inflows. TDS is not shown as a tax outflow because it is not that you've paid, you've not received it. So you don't show it as an outflow. Then, one transaction may have multiple cash flows is uh, what we have discussed, payment to supplier which has both principal and interest. Then you have to split it. We discussed it's an important case. Now cash outflow for acquisition of a set which is given on rent operating lease. Now here this is a specific treatment prescribed by the Indians. Let me tell you what is this case. So let's say for example our company provides self driven car on rents for one day one week one month or one year there's this very popular concept which is developing nowadays where you get self driven cars as in you take the car on rent you just pay the rent and then you return the car <clears throat> it's like a library going, taking a book and returning. Obviously, they'll take your deposits and all for their security. But this is the business. The business basically gives you the benefit that you're making rental income out of it. It is definitely an operating lease for the lesser. Now, if you remember, we have discussed this earlier that uh, if you are into the business of operating leases of any asset, then at once day you may classify that asset that it is no more eligible for being rented out further. So let's sell it as a scrap residual value. We've discussed this that this is regarded as transferring that asset to inventory. So all this while for the lesser operating lease asset is shown as a asset in its book. Remember for lesser we still classify lease as finance and operating and operating lease we still record PP in our books and then we show depreciation expense in our books and the rental which we get everything is our income. So I'm talking about that operating lesser who's giving an asset on operating lease. That means for not the useful life of the asset but shorter period. The intention is to make money out of rents and not to earn financially. 
in these cases the rental income which you will be getting will be your operating cash in which is clear second thing when you acquire this asset and record it as a pp it is your investing outflow third when you classify this asset as held for sale it is not shown as non current asset held for sale but shown as inventory because indes assumes that it is your core business so many of such assets will keep on getting reclassified as asset held for sale so this is also a part of your business so when you rent a car on operating basis you know that you have to sell your second hand cars also this is also your operating basis and that is why whenever you sell your used cars it will be treated as an operating cash inflow and not an investing inflow so when you purchase the asset it will be an operating outflow you will show it in your books as investment property or pp depending on the element of service in one but when you on operating lease rental this is your operating inflow it will be treated as income and financial statement when you classify this as held for sale there is no cash flow at that stage but here it is classified as inventory and then when you sell it it will be treated as operating and not investing in because in financial statement it is also regarded as revenue and not profit on sale of asset this is another important discussion and this is the most important of this in days which is business combination business combination let's come to that so let's come to business combinations now in business combination it is pretty simple one company has acquired another company let's say it is an absorption we will discuss subsidiary later so when you have acquired another company you would have paid pc in cash or in shares or other form whatever pc you have paid in shares or other form ignore that whatever you have paid in cash is your investing outflow just remember one thing when you acquire another company that company may also have some cash and cash equivalent which will belong to you so the pc which you have paid in cash minus the cash and cash equivalent of the target company which comes to the acquirer company that net amount of pc is something which is to be shown as investing outflow so what we have to do here is pc paid in other than cash you just have to disclose not presented in cash flow statement what disclosures we have to give we will discuss date later pc paid in cash the full amount paid in cash in pc minus the cash and cash equivalent acquired in business combination this net amount is shown as investing outflow but let's say you have done an investment in subsidiary or you have sold investment in subsidiary so it is acquisition of shares and not acquisition of company so in separate financial statement if you are acquiring shares of a subsidiary or a company which is now being a subsidiary it is an investing outflow whether it is a subsidiary jv associate or a normal investment similarly when you sell it it will be an investing inflow unless you are in a, to the business of investment let's say you are an investment entity then it will become an operating cash outflow and inflow for you so usually it will be investing except if you are an investment entity this is simple this is important and tricky now how will i prepare the consolidated cash flow statement of the parent so we have discussed in consolidation that in preparing consolidated cash flow statement of the parent we take parent as well as subsidiary's cash flow and add it on line to line basis but we will add subsidiary's cash flows only from the date when we have acquired the subsidiary post to that date that is something which we have discussed as a consolidation procedure what we have to discuss here is when i acquire shares of a company and make it my subsidiary let's say i have paid pc in cash in separate financial statement i have shown that as an investing outflow but what in consolidated financial statement so one the cash which you have paid 
against which because you are showing subsidiary and parent as one entity in consolidated financial statement you would have received some cash in cash gland back so that will be reduced that net amount of cash outflow is your investing outflow but what will happen in consolidated financial statement apart from this is there will be a lot of new pp which you would have acquired through subsidiary investments current assets so what the india says is if the investment is in subsidiary company by an investment company it is operating but if that is not the case if it leads to acquisition of control or loss of control the outflow or inflow is treated as investing activity net of cash and cash equivalent acquired that's it but if there is no loss of control or acquisition of control which means it is a transaction with equity participant then that cash flow is treated as financing activity and not investing so i had 70% shares of subsidiary and i have sold 10% shares in sfs i will show it as an investing inflow but in cfs because this is not going to lead to loss of subsidiary rather it will increase the nci so this 10% stake which i have sold which is not lead to a loss of control will be treated as a financing inflow if i acquire another 10% and make my stake 80% the payment which i have made will be treated as financing outflow because it is just changing your nci and funds so transaction with equity participants if it happens any cash inflow or outflow is financing otherwise all is investing so you can remember it like this everything is investing except if you are an investment entity it is operating except if it is a transaction with equity participant it is financing rest everything is investing but in investing in consolidated financial statement if you are acquiring any cash in cash equivalent then the net amount of cash outflow is only shown as investing outflow and this is something which is pretty much important not just this you will also have to be a little careful when you get a full fledged question relating to business combination because of that what we will do is we will try to handle one question one comprehensive question to prepare cash flow statement which involves business acquisition <clears throat> entity a acquired a subsidiary entity b during the year ended 31st march 2020 summarized information from consolidated statement of profit and loss in balance sheet is provided together with sub supplementary information consolidated statement of profit or loss for the year ended march 2020 revenue gp dbtt fact previous year balance sheet current year balance sheet 2020 2019 cash and cash equivalent trade receivable inventory pp equivalent trade payable income tax payable long term debt total outside liability shareholder equity total liability and shareholder equity so these two are just the totals all shares of b were acquired for 37000 in cash so in cash flow statement of consolidated financial statement this will be treated as investing outflow How much? Thirty-seven thousand minus fair value of assets acquired and liabilities assumed is one thousand. So you've got back one thousand out of thirty-seven. So thirty-six will be our investing outflow. Now please understand for this thirty-seven, what you've paid, what has happened. When you show thirty-seven as investing outflow, or thirty-six as investing outflow. what you also understand is that there are these set of things which have been further acquired just make sure that you once again do not do adjustment for all these things because all these things which you have acquired 
which you can see let's say for example 2 plus 4 6 plus 1 7 plus 55 62 minus 16 46 minus 18 which will be 28 so you have acquired net asset of 28,000 and you have paid 37 so you have booked goodwill of 9,000 please understand these things which you have acquired are all treated as part of investing outflow why because you have said investing outflow is 37 minus 1 36 now when you say 37 minus 1 36 is your investing outflow it simply means what what does it means it simply means that 36000 rupees of net cash you have paid to acquire a set of asset which also includes inventory to receivable of the target company acquiring so now you don't say the inventory 2000 which you have acquired will be treated as operating outflow <clears throat> so there were two alternative approaches which the indians would have given you one it would have said out of 37000 let's split whatever you paid for goodwill treated as investing outflow what you paid for inventory treated as operating outflow no India says whatever total PC you have paid is investing outflow. Whether you have got operating assets or you have got long term assets. Whether you have got liabilities or you have got operating liabilities or financing liabilities. We don't uh, split the PC into operating non operating assets. We simply say the full PC which you have paid is an investing outflow. So please understand this increase of 2000 in inventory is not going to be affecting your operating cash flows as changes in working capital so only once we solve this particular full question you'll get to know what i'm trying to explain one question should be sufficient to kind of understand this i required to prepare consolidated cash flow statement there are a whole lot of questions like this i mean there are too many questions like this we'll just try to solve one of them that's it So let's try it out. So do we expect such questions in the exam? I mean, I really institute should not be asking. I mean, come on, cash flow statement preparation at CA final level. But then it is not that it has not been asked. In fact, the question which we are just doing is a exam question, November 2020. So I mean, you know, with CA institute, you can never be sure. They may ask you whatever. So rather than questioning why What's the purpose? Let's understand it. So we are talking about payment. How do we progress with such questions? I mean, this is not really very tricky. Quite doable. <clears throat> you will have to in such questions. Recall the concepts which you have studied in your intermediate. Wealth commerce, if you had of preparing cash flow. What we used to do is we used to prepare ledger accounts for everything and then see the balancing figures effect on cash flow statement. You could do that or you can make simple working notes to manage it. So, what we will do is we will simply start preparing consolidated cash flow statement. It is always prepared for the period ended as in for the period, not as on date 31st March 2020. <laughs> Let's keep a good space for things. We will start with particulars amount, which is fine. Let's start with operating cash flows. Because we will use indirect method, we will start with profit. We can start with before tax. Your profit before tax are 35,000 is where we start. What do we add to it? 
the profit before tax anything which is already reduced from it but is not a part of operating activities will be added back so let's first add non cash expense which is nothing but depreciation of 15000 then let us add non operating expense which is nothing but interest of 2000 I can't see any kind of non-operating incomes to be reduced, so let's avoid that. So it is time for changes in working capital. If you want, you can say fifty-two thousand is your operating profits or cash flows before working capital changes. Now we'll have to do adjustment for working capital changes as in current assets and liabilities which are relating to working capital. So we'll have to now go to the balance sheet. Cash in cash equivalent is point number one which will be opening closing. So let's kind of skip that. Trade receivable have increased from 25 to 27. So there is a change in the trade receivable. So we will add less working capital changes. Now see please how you have to do this. What you will have to say is your trade receivables have increased. If they have increased your working capital changes. So if you want to like see it here as a part of working note, let me show it here. <clears throat> Let's put it like this. Closing. Opening. In this case, you will have to specifically take one more column, which is acquired in business combination and changes. So let's start with trade receipts. 25, 725. What is acquired in business combination is for. Now, please let me explain. What it means is that you had opening 25. If nothing happened during the year, it should be 25 at year end. But business combination happened, so it should be 29 at year end. If your closing were 29, we would have said there is no change in working capital except due to business combination. But due to business combination, the 4000 of trade receivables which you have got, we have treated that as a part of investing outflow. Because we have treated the whole PC as investing outflow. So we will not consider this as a part of my operating outflow because this is not an operating outflow. So acquisition and business combination is treated not as operating, but it is actually an investing cash flow. This is the special point which you have to understand. So what you will have to say is that my closing is 27, but my opening was 25. So there is a 2000 increase. Actually, there should have been a 4,000 increase. So effectively, there is a 2,000 reduction. There is a 2,000 decline. This will lead to what? It will lead to to, 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 to cash flow statement. It will lead to 2,000 rupees of cash inflow. So what you can do is you can say 2,000 rupees cash inflow added. Why? Because your uh, trade receivable should be 29 but are 27. That means you have 2000 rupees during the year you have encashed letters. So that is why your trade receivables are increased. So this is going to work like this. So then we have inventories. Closing 15. Opening 17500. You further acquired 2000. So it should be 19500 but it is 15 so that means 4500 is sold during the year and cash during the year so you will add this as well additional uh, pp changes are not going to be treated as working capital changes they might be considered as a part of investing outflow so let's not consider that goodwill also no. it's just current asset liability then we have trade payables they have gone up to 34 from 30. Now we acquired trade payables which were worth my god 16,000. So ideally it should have been how much 46 but it is 34. So it means we have reduced it by 12,000. 
this will be an outflow that means you've paid 12,000 rupees during the year as trade payments. Income tax payable I will consider in taxes paid and not here. Long term debt not considered, so that's about it. So inventory and trade payables will lead to plus 4,500 minus 12,000. Or you could have just taken a total year and then adjusted it. So during the year, trade receivables, inventories, everything have got reduced. So this will give you your operating cash flows. As 46,500. Treated as operating cash flows before tax. And then we'll have to reduce tax paid. Now, what is tax paid? So, if you feel that you're not comfortable, you can always prepare a ledger. Opening balance of income tax payable was 5500. Closing balance is 6000. Your income tax expense for the year is 7500. So 13000 should have been your liability. But it is 6000 only, which means you paid 7000. This is the easiest way to, but the time consuming way to calculate any cash flow. This is your cash flows from operating activities. Then we'll have to come co cash flows from investing activities. And we get that. Once again, first you should say PC for acquisition of subsidy. How much did you pay? 37. How much cash in cash equivalent did you receive? So 1000. So your, this will be an outflow of 36,000 to start with. Apart from this, what else? So let's see the balance sheet and PP have increased. So within PP now what you will have to do. So if you again once again create a working note. So for all the assets and liabilities. Non-current assets and liabilities. You will have to once again say what is your closing PP. Minus your opening PP. Minus your business combination acquired PP. That is the net amount which is going to give you a watch. Your acquisition during the year, no. Depreciation also. What you have charged on PP. So let me show you. PP closing is 80. Opening is 40. Depreciation charged is 15. I am assuming all is on PP. And the business combination, the PP acquired is 55,000. So now logically, let's understand it. You had 40,000 of PP. You acquired 55,000, so it should be 95. This 55, what you have acquired, cash flows relating to it have already been included in investing outflow. So we will not again include it to avoid double counting. 95, on which you have charged depreciation of 15. So the closing should be 80. So opening plus Acquired minus depreciation should be equal to closing. Uh, if this is not uh, matching. So we will say the balance is something which we have done what we required. So what is the cash flow during the year? It is nil. 
this ideally should be what there are no cash flows why because your actual closing balance is coming to be 80 only which is given us to be the balance there's no pp acquired apart from business combination is what i mean to say you can see for goodwill also it is 9000 which is nothing but business combination so in goodwill opening was nil business combination was nine depreciation is nothing and closing is nine so that means there's no fresh acquisition apart from business combination then trade payables you've considered income tax payable you've taken long-term debt is what you can take your opening was 32,000 you acquired a long-term debt of 18,000 from business combination there is no depreciation on it it should be 50 and it is in fact 50 so there's no fresh change so within these things, there are no cash flows during it. <clears throat> Shareholder equity, yes. It was 17,500. If you want, you can consider it here. Depreciation or you can say reserves. So we can calculate it separately for equity, I guess. It's always better, you know, to make a ledger account. It is least confusing. The shareholder equity, what was your opening balance? 17,500. What is your profit for the year? Which will increase your shareholder equity? 27,500. So what should be your closing balance? because there are no dividends paid sir it should be 55,000 but it is 45,000 only oh my gosh oh it is 45 <laughs> my god what am I doing 275 plus 175 45 45 Let's say profits were more and then still it was showing like this. So balancing figure will be treated as dividend paid financing outflow, which is not the case here. So there are no cash flows per se. Now let's see if there is anything else which is left. Nothing per se. <clears throat> so you don't have anything apart from this. So you'll just simply say investing activity 36. Cash flows from financing activities. There's nothing from debt or equity. We will just see if in case there is any interest or other things. So if you see the statement of profit and loss, you'll find interest cost 2000. We'll say interest outflow because there is no outstanding interest or anything at year end. So it means <clears throat> it's an outflow. So cash flows from all operations will be A plus B plus C which is uh, 1,500. Your opening cash in cash equivalent is 2,500. Your closing cash in cash equivalent should be 4,000. That's it. So what about that 1,000 cash which we have received? I've already adjusted it from here. If I would have taken out flow is 37,000 then I would have said my total cash flows are 500 so my closing cash should have been 3,000 but it is 4,000 because I've got 1,000 from them I'll not say that hey I've just paid 36 because I know I've got one net back this is the way you'll have to prepare your cash flow statement the question only asks for cash flow statements so we're not giving any disclosures otherwise disclosures might also have to be given. So now you can try, there are a plethora of questions here, which you can practice. I won't suggest one should be more than enough. Just in case if you want to practice, you can take advice on another one. But honestly speaking, this is good enough for you. Because you know, it's, I mean, there's no end to it then in that particular case into how many questions can you practice. And this kind of completes your discussion on business combination how does cash flow is affected now we can come to the remaining set of things
derivatives. Boys and girls, if you have any derivative instrument taken, what will you, how will you account? So derivative as a word means derived and accordingly in cash flow statement also its classification is derived. So you will see why have you taken the derivatives and the purpose for which you have taken derivative will define <clears throat> where it will be classified. Number one, if your business is in derivative trading, you are a punter, then obviously all your derivatives are operating. But you have taken derivative to hedge, let's say a foreign currency derivative is taken to hedge a foreign currency exposure. We have an import to be made. So we need dollars after six months. So I have taken a derivative contract of forward dollar purchase. So have you taken this forward forward purchase? You will pay some premium on this. Why have you done this? Basically because you are purchasing goods, importing goods after six months. So that is your operating activity. So the premium on this derivative will also be your operating activity. So the cash flows in this derivative will be operating. Whereas if this was for a machine to be imported, the premium will be treated as investing. If it was for a loan which we have taken to be repaid, then in that particular case or loan to be taken, then in that case it will be financed. So if it is for hedging, then it will be classified under respective head for which hedging is done. And this is what we discussed. But uh, if it is uh, nothing of these, just treat it as investing, as in you are basically doing it for speculative purposes. And it is not your core business. Financial institutions for them, advances given and repaid to customers, huh? not from RBI and all other banks, to customer. Our operating investment made sold, operating demand deposit accepted, repaid operating. But remember, deposits which NBFC take will be financing and not operating because these deposits are usually long term in nature and not a part of your core business, but to finance, which is important. Next. <clears throat> Let's say during the year you have. Acquired PP or cash 50 lakhs and you have also sold PP for cash 60 lakhs. How to present? Do we show investing outflow 50? Investing in flow 60 or simply investing in flow 10. How? A or B? The answer is A, not B. That means netting off is not permitted. In fact, if you remember in government grants also we discussed that government grants if you get for PP, you have an option to offset it, net it off. <clears throat> From the cost of PP or show it as gross. But for cash flow statement, uh, India's 20 does not apply because India's 20 says offsetting is not allowed. You will have to show gross separately. So government grant received for uh, Acquiring PP, investing in flow, PP acquired, investing outflow. Government grant received for generally running business, financing in flow, it is funding. And then you do operating expenses, it is operating outflow. Similarly, any PP acquired during the year, sold during the year, you can club all PP acquired and show it as collective PP acquired, investing outflow. And all PP sold during the year, you can club and show PP. Sold, that means investing in flow. But what you cannot do is you cannot just show it net, except in two cases. Only in these two cases, netting off is permitted. The first case is where the cash flows are basically on behalf of some other person.
So when bank receives uh, demand deposits and people also withdraw during the year, you don't have to show gross how much amount has been deposited across, how much has been withdrawn. You can show net. This is net increase because that's otherwise not your money. It's somebody else's and they're just keeping it with you. And the second case is where turnover is quick, volumes are large and maturities are short. So this is basically when you kind of purchase and sell immediately. This is like, you know, there are some agents who actually buy goods and then they sell it immediately. In fact, only once they have the sale order, they make the purchase order. So legally they are principal. They buy on their own risk and they sell at their own risk. But they actually never buy unless and until there is a seller available. However, they don't buy on behalf of the seller. In case the seller refuses at the last moment not to have the goods, they will still buy it and keep it with themselves. But it is very rare. Usually they'll buy soya bean only when there is a seller who says, I need this much of soya bean. So they'll buy and they'll immediately sell it. They'll buy gold only when they have a buyer for gold and they'll immediately sell it. So commodity brokers do it like that. So when you have quick turnovers with short maturities, in such cases also you can net off. Otherwise you cannot just net off. You have to show it separately. So guys, these are all the principles which you'll have to keep in mind if you have to prepare a proper cash flow statement. The last thing is disclosures. Number one, business combination, you have to give complete disclosure, nature of transaction, as in whether it is acquisition of shares or absorption of company. The total PC paid. The cash flows, that means among PC, what is paid in cash. The cash and cash equivalents acquired the date of investment. So in PC you will have to say <clears throat> total PC, cash and non-cash because we are not talking about cash flow statement but disclosure in cash flow statement. So there will have to show totally. Very important. Now if you have foreign currency in hand, so let's say you have opening dollars hundred. And in closing also you have $100, but the exchange rate has changed and because of India's 21 foreign currency is to be measured at closing rate. So there will be an increase of 500 in your cash and cash equivalent. There is no real cash inflow or outflow. It is just a change in the value of currency. That is why this foreign exchange gain of 500 in cash and cash equivalent is shown separately from operating, investing, financing in cash and cash equivalent. <clears throat> So as a part of reconciliation and opening, closing, cash and cash equivalent, you can show it. Please remember this 500 will not be operating activity. Why? Because there is no cash flow. See, what I said is that if any cash flow is not classifiable under any head, put it under operating. But there is no cash flow here. <clears throat> so if there is no cash flow, you cannot just classify it anywhere. You just cannot classify it anywhere because there's no cash flow, but your opening closing will not match. So it will be shown as a reconciliation adjustment under cash and cash equivalent. But if you could have an example or a question on this, of course, why not? That is what striker is question for every concept. Please come relax. Oops, what it says, Z Limited India has overseas branch in USA, it has a bank account of $7,000 on 1st April in 1920, it acquired computers, 280 on which amount was paid on same date. No other transaction in US or India. Exchange rate in INR and USDR, opening 70, purchase of computer 71, closing 71.5, average 70.5, extract of cash flow statement as per relevant in days and foreign exchange profitability from these transactions. So first 280 into 71 is your investing outflow because it is office computer. So 19,880. will be your investing outflow. 
So let's solve this question. It's a good interesting. So working note, we'll have to first calculate our profits. <clears throat> Why? Because during the year, obviously, if you are using indirect method, we'll start with profit before tax. What are my profits? I'll have to calculate. How will I calculate profit? There'll be only foreign exchange gain related profits. Now there are various ways to do it. One is simply prepare a ledger account, which is the best way. Let's say we will prepare a foreign currency bank. Okay. This bank account, when you prepare, what you do is ledger accounts are T shaped only. Because foreign currency is involved, what you do is you prepare three columns. US dollar exchange rate rupees, US dollar exchange rate rupees. Your two balance write down is how much. This is the easiest way to calculate the correct. 7000, I guess. Yeah. What was the exchange rate then? 70. 490. Then you have acquired PP. This date you will book it at spot rate exchange rate 71. What is your balance carried down? 672C. Should be at 71.5 480 480 the total is 5 lakh 360 10360 is your Foreign exchange fluctuation gain, which is nothing but on two hundred and eighty dollar one rupee six seven two zero dollar one point five zero. You can calculate it. This is just for your logic. You don't really have to do it. So what this basically shows is one zero three six zero is your foreign currency gain. You could have calculated it in any fashion. So now while you prepare your cash flow statement for your year ended, just write the whole thing cash flow statement. I'm just quickly solving it. This is for April 2020. I'm not focusing on the format too much. We will start with operating cash flows. Profit before tax. Calculated it to be one zero three six zero, which will have to show that this one zero three six zero is what on cash item. There is no other change in working capital, so your operating cash flows will be then you have investing outflows which we have calculated as 19880 and there is no financing of course. The total cash flows will be 19880. Now what you'll do is opening cash in cash equivalent is 4,90,000. You'll show foreign exchange fluctuation. During the year is one zero three six zero. So you are closing cash in cash equivalent. Let's say it should be 
B plus C plus A or minus A. Four eight zero four eight zero, which is exactly the balance we have calculated. Four eight zero four eight zero. A beautiful question. Very good practice question. On for say yeah, fool, wonderful. Then in disclosures, you have to give components of cash equivalent with breakup as in cash, bank balance, foreign currency. Plus, if any cash equivalent has any restriction escrow that you can't use it. Sometimes you have a lien marked or something. Yeah. It is optional, not mandatory to show cooperating cash flows to maintain the capacity or increase them. Many a times you may incur a lot of maintenance expense on your PP. Now these maintenance expenses are not capital expenditures, so shown as a part of operating cash flows. But they are equally important to ensure that your capacities are maintained. So people may want to show this separately. No problem. You can show it if you wish. So that people know that how much are we investing and also how much are we spending to maintain our assets and not just fresh investments because maintenance is equally important. We discussed earlier where we said, I told you that we have to, to be discussed that um, Whenever there is an interest or dividend component, it is to be shown separately. So if you remember or recall the example which we discussed was in deferred credit. Or let's say even a better example was finance lease. So in a finance lease payment, you have to split separately, maybe in the cash flow statement or in the notes. Interest and principal. You can show it in the notes. Though both of them are financing outflows. But you will have to split in. If there is any change in financial liability, you can disclose as in how much is due to cash and non-cash. Any cash flow which is not available for use as in there is restricted cash flows. You can mention that. Government grants cannot be set it off. You have to short separately and this completes all your disclosure requirement with the index let's do the remaining set of questions you've done one you've done two three let's come to four z has no foreign currency cash flow in 17 it holds some deposit in usa the bank balance and opening closing is one lakh and one lakh two thousand opening exchange rate is 45 Closing exchange rate is 50. Interest is 2000. Deposit was reported at 45 lakh and 51 lakh. How are these to be presented? Assume interest is recognized at closing rate, otherwise it should be average rate. So what you'll do is interest will be treated as a part of operating cash flows. So there are basically, what is the profit? Let's just calculate, we'll just do it here. Profit for the year would be 51 lakh minus 45 lakh, 6 lakh. In which interest is $2,000 into 51 lakh. And foreign exchange gain is 5 lakh. What is 5 lakh? Nothing but 1 lakh dollar into 5 rupees. Okay. This is $2,000 into 50 rupees. So when you go with the direct method, in RT4, if it is a direct method, show 5 lakh, sorry, 1 lakh interest. As operating cash flows and 5 lakh foreign exchange gain 
एज रिकनसिलियेशन ऑफ कैश इन कैश ही की बिल बट इफ इट इज इनडायरेक्ट मेथड इन एग्जाम ऑलवेज इफ द क्वेश्चन इज साइलेंट एज यूम इनडायरेक्ट मेथड so what we will say is our profit before tax under operating cash flows हेलो प्रॉफिट बिफोर टैक्स वुड बी सिक्स लैक्स यू विल डिडक्ट नॉन कैश प्रॉफिट फॉरन एक्सचेंज गेन फाइव लैक and you will show your operating cash flows opening cash and cash equivalent was what if i likes for an exchange gain on it 5 lakh For closing cash and cash equal six. The answer given is not so elaborate. It basically theoretically explains you that, but you'll be comfortable to understand this if you understand first what I've written. To reconcile opening and closing, the balance five lakh should be added to opening balance. The handle was credited by one lakh for interest and five lakh for a foreign exchange difference. Five lakh difference will be deducted from net profit before tax on extraordinary item. So there's nothing like extraordinary item now. The ICI says that. It's just a very old question, so that's why I mean we probably the institute used AS terminologies. But there's nothing like extraordinary. So you'll show net profit six lakh, and then you'll deduct five lakhs from this. So you'll get net profit one lakh, which is your operating cash flow. So remember, one lakh interest is operating cash flow because we have discussed any interest on cash and cash equivalent is a part of operating cash. Beautiful question. Clear. Boys and girls, tell me. Yes, sir. Enough for the day. Yeah, we just left with one more question, I guess. Company A acquires seventy percent of equity stake in Company B on twentieth of July. The consideration paid is cash fifteen lakh, two lakh equity share at fifteen per share. So this will be thirty lakh. This will be only disclosed in cash flow statement. TFS in this chapter is cash flow statement. B has cash and cash equivalent of two point five lakhs in the books of account. So what we will say is we will show investing outflow as twelve point five zero lakh. That's it. Next, tenth October, further ten percent stake acquired for eight lakh. This will be treated as financing outflow because it's a transaction with equity participants. So fifteen less two point five acquisition of subsidiary investing activity and ten percent under financing. 
This completes your all discussion with respect to this particular index, and this completes your cash flow statement in this seven, and this completes all your end. Yes, congratulations and celebrations. So we're done with this particular set of standards, and we're done with everything. We just left with theory topics in this particular batch, guys. And today was our 69th lecture, maybe one or two lectures for the remaining theory topics, so 71 lectures, approximately three hours, approximately in 200 hours we've completed the whole syllabus of financial reporting. With enough amount of practice, I mean there was no dearth of practice. Enough practice. And all these question answers that you have discussed will also be accessible in the QR codes. Scan it and enjoy the videos for those answers. Nevertheless, thank you very much. That's it for the day. And uh, we will continue with the remaining theory topics and then complete our whole syllabus. But we are done with all the chapters and all the videos. Thank you.